and bank or on bonk. Law French, on the bench, adverb and adjective. With all judges present and participating in full court, the court heard the case on bonk and on bonk rehearing. Also spelled I N B A N C or I N B A N K, also termed in bonko. Well, that was a reading from one of my favorite storybooks, Black's Law Dictionary, 7th edition, um, with the editor in chief being Brian Garner. Uh, that was the term on bonk, or as some people say, in bank. And we're going to be talking about some on bonk cases and the history of the word on bonk or words and how you pronounce that thing anyway today on Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Friday, February 10th, 2023. Now, today's episode is a reunion of sorts, an encore, uh, to use the terminology of the day, uh, with a couple of my colleagues. Um, and we'll get into the history there and this en banc stuff in a little bit. But first, um, I have a few announcements for uh, folks about what's coming up at the Institute for Justice and the Center for Judicial Engagement. Uh, we have a, a very busy calendar right now. Uh, but most importantly, most immediately, for people in the Cleveland area, so our fans in Ohio, uh, around Northern Ohio, around Cleveland, you have a couple opportunities to come and engage with some of us at IJ. Um, and this is related to a case that we have pending at the U.S. Supreme Court, which I think is going to, to conference in, in just a week. Um, it is called Novak v. Parma. We've actually talked about it a couple times on Short Circuit, but um, it's more commonly known these days as the, the Onion amicus brief case. So you may remember a few months ago, uh, The Onion filed an amicus brief in a for a cert petition at the U.S. Supreme Court. It got a lot of play. It was super funny. Um, it actually was an IJ case um, where that we have a cert petition for, and we represent this guy, Anthony Novak, who uh, had the audacity to make fun of his local police department on Facebook and then got arrested for it. He went to court, and the court found that those officers had qualified immunity. So we have a couple events. Uh, one is at Case Western Reserve University at noon on Friday the 17th. You, It's free, but you need a ticket um, so you can register ahead of time, and we'll put a link up in the show notes for that. There will be Patrick Giacomo, IJ attorney and um, frequent guest on Short Circuit. You guys should know his voice well. He will be on the panel. Our client Anthony Novak will be on the panel. And also our old friend at IJ, Professor um, Jonathan Adler, will be there as well. So that's at Case Western Reserve in the Cleveland area. Then the very next day at the Grog Shop, which is a comedy club in Cleveland Heights, the very next day, Friday, or I'm sorry, Saturday, February 18th at 6 p.m., there's going to be a free comedy show, um, which is called Comedy is Not a Crime. It's going to be uh, headlined by local comedian uh, Mary Santora, and there'll be other comedians performing, and it'll just be kind of a, a good time to raise awareness about uh, the fight against qualified immunity, sponsored by Americans Against Qualified Immunity. So if you're in the Cleveland area, we'd love for you to, to join us at either one of those events. And again, we'll put links in the show notes to those. Also, um, I've mentioned before, but we'll just briefly mention again, we have a conference right by the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill on Friday, March 31st. It is the 100th anniversary a conference for the case Meyer versus Nebraska, which came out in 1923 and led to all kinds of developments in the 20th century about the protection of individual rights. It uh, has a slew of amazing speakers. And so um, if you live in the area and you'd like to come celebrate the anniversary of Meyer, please come and join us. Again, we'll put a link in the show notes for that. And um, if you don't live in the D.C. area, but you'd like to, to see it, we're going to live stream it. And then we'll also have the videos available later. Okay, finally, before we turn to our on banc panel... 
don't think I've mentioned on Short Circuit before, but I may have, but I've definitely mentioned elsewhere, um, that I have a book coming out later this year. It's coming out in May. It is about state constitutions and unenumerated rights. It's called Baby Ninth Amendments. Um, and if you'd like to pre-order a copy, we'll put a link up in the show notes for that. It also will be available for free when it uh, comes out as it's an open access uh, publication. It's being published by the good people at University of Michigan Press. And we'll t- be talking a lot more about that and uh, state constitutions and all that stuff in coming weeks. I just wanted to mention it today. Okay, now to our headline event. So joining me today are Sam Gedge and Bob Belden. Now, the last time the three of us were together on Short Circuit was just over a year ago in January 2022, and I was talking about this thing on Bonk. And Bob and Sam, what did you guys say about that that phrase. What, well, how uh, did you pronounce I think, it? I, I think yeah, I, I pronounced it in bank. I thought I pronounced it in bank. I, I mean, I definitely pronounce it in bank because yeah. I think about it every time I hear somebody say. Every yeah. time I hear somebody say, uh, I, th- I thought I thought that you and I were on the opposite side of this riotous debate, Bob. But I guess it was just Anthony was out. Uh, I think on his so. Own with that. I think I said in bank and Anthony called me out and Sam came in, you know, to support me. That's the way I remember. And, and, and I was like, I've never heard that before. And and I had two people on the show, both pronouncing it this ridiculous way, uh, this very un-French way, right? The French would never say in bank. Um, and so I was like, I got a couple of hicks that I work with. Um, but it turns out, it turns out that... Um, some of my best friends are Hicks, I, I should add. But it it turns out that uh, y- lots of people say it the way you guys do. So that got me wondering, well, what what's up with in bank, on bank? And so um, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole researching the, the history of this term. And um, a very smart uh, summer clerk of ours last summer, Matt Lyles, who is uh, still a student at the University of Texas School of Law, so shout out to, to Matt and um, you know, treat him kindly, professors and students down there. He, um, he did some tremendous research and we just put it together and turned it into a, a quite irreverent, all the irreverence is mine, article about the history of this term en banc. And to cut a very long, well, not that long, but a fairly long story short that you can go read the draft of the article. Uh, we'll put another link in the show notes to that. Um, the term kind of came out of old French, but originally it was really a German word, bank. That's where we actually get the word bank in English or bench is from the same root, this Germanic root. And um, it wasn't an old, like, you know, Julius Caesar Roman classical Latin word. It was actually imported in the Middle Ages. And um, it was used in law French in England, and everyone probably knows that story about the Normans coming to England and introducing French. Um, but it was usually in banco, I-N, not E-N. And uh, en banc is a word that they use in French today in France. They, they use that phrase. But um, the, way, the one we use today in America is kind of a 19th century invention. And so the long and the short of it is it's kind of a made up thing anyway, so there's really no right way to say it. So everybody is right. You're right, Bob. You're right, Sam. Everyone out there, whatever you want to say about this word, en banc, you're right. So it's like a John Lennon thing, you know, do your own thing where everyone's cool. It's postmodern. Um, so we can all be we can all be friends again because we're all pronouncing it correctly. Um, but that doesn't mean that courts adjudicate en banc procedures correctly. And that's what we're going to be getting into today with a couple cases from the 11th Circuit and the DC Circuit that one of which chose to go en banc and one of which said, yeah, not so much. So Sam, take us down the path of the uh, 11th Circuit and why it went en banc. And in fact, it was unanimous on bonk, even though some of the judges on the panel were the on the original panel that got reversed. 
That's uh, that's all correct, Anthony. And I'm glad that you ran to ground the the pronunciation of of Enbank versus Enbank and and confirmed that they are both and neither of them correct. Um, so can, can I can I quickly take us on a, on a slight detour before we talk about the 11th? I think I think this week is all about the detours. So the detour okay, away. So, so we we were talking about this like for about a second before you started recording, and then I want I said I wanted to save this until we were talking so that we could inflict it on all of your your listeners. Um, but now that you have. Um, solve the end bank quandary. I kind of wanted to raise another thing that's bedeviled me for several years, which is the kind of the difference between vacatur and reversal. And Bob made some flippant comment about decretal language in our kind of prep as well. Um, it's no laughing matter though, Bob, um, because I have just always been really confused when you when you're kind of an appellate judge and you have that little bit at the bottom of your opinion, typically. Sometimes they seem to say they reverse the district court. Sometimes they say they vacate. Um, the Supreme Court does this as well. And I don't know. I haven't done a deep dive, but it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of rhyme or reason. Or if there is, I don't really know what it is. Um, so I don't know. I just kind of wanted to throw it out there, see if you guys had any ideas. Anthony, you could write a, another article about it. Um, the one other thing I'll say, though, is that um, the Second Circuit's Judge Newman, I believe, wrote an article about this at one point, which I read and don't really remember much about. But I don't remember actually getting the so, answer. So about you so. mean about reversal versus vacator he wrote yeah, yeah. he yeah. also actually wrote a, a, a an opinion that we cite in our article about um on bonk or in bonk um that was that, really that's quite oh, yeah interesting. i think you're so, right yeah um we should just have him on to well, talk we should to we should have all this judge, judge newman on um i th i've always thought so that difference i pondered as well and i'm sure that there is probably an answer to this in some of our uh, experience appellate practitioner friends we probably could have on to um to to talk about this i think it's that reverse is more you you got something this point of law wrong or you you abuse the facts and so you need to do it over and we're showing you how whereas vacator is more you there was something that affected the argument, but you, you're going to do it over. But it's not like you got this point exactly wrong. If you if you see the d distinction, I think there's there's some, probably something more technical to it than that. But that's the feeling I've always had. Yeah, that seems like a good feeling. Um, I don't know, Bob. You can think about it while I talk about. You know, the, the, no, you, you have some thoughts. Okay. Well, the ahead. Newman article that you reference, it like rattled a part of my brain that hasn't worked in a while. And I think I've read, I think I've read the same article that came up, uh, came up in a case I litigated in a past life when a, a, a circuit court sent, sent us back to the district court and said, um, I think it just said summary judgment reversed and it was sent back. And there were, there were a few things that the other side had appealed on and we weren't, we we weren't really sure how bound we were by by certain parts of the opinion. It was a it was a knotty issue, but like you, Sam, I can't remember can't remember exactly how it worked out. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, we solved that. So, um, shall we? Okay, I'll talk about the eleventh eleventh circuit. circuit. Um, so this case uh, involves the Prison Litigation Reform Act. I think it's of nineteen ninety six. Um, which places restrictions on the ability of prisoners to file civil rights suits. Um, we're going to have to go a little bit in the weeds on a kind of informa pauperous status and the PLRA. Um, but I'll flag a couple of things up front, which are kind of noteworthy. One, this is a, a case litigated by, by our friends at the MacArthur Justice Center, um, and they won. Um, so congrats to them. Um, and two, it's an unusual case where the end bank decision is actually authored by two judges, um, Judge uh, Jill Pryor and uh, Judge Luck. So a uh, pretty, pretty rare phenomenon. I think I can only think of two examples. I'm sure there are others at the Supreme Court, like Planned Parenthood v. Casey, I think had a multi-justice plurality opinion. And there was the, the joint dissent in one of the Affordable Care Act cases. So kind of rare. I'm, I'm honestly not quite sure why this particular case has, has two judges authoring it, but it, it's noteworthy. So first, uh, I guess some background. Um, so the general rule for civil litigation in federal court and probably most state courts is that the plaintiff files their complaint and they have to pay a filing fee up front. I think, I think it's like 
$400 in federal court. I might be off by that a little bit. And then the defendant responds. And the defendant can respond on a bunch of different grounds and a bunch of different ways. Um, but one thing that a defendant can try to do is cut the lawsuit off at its knees by filing a motion to dismiss and say, you know, there's no jurisdiction or you failed to state a claim on which relief can be granted, you know, all, all sorts of things. Um, and typically, once the defendant files that kind of motion, the plaintiff gets to respond and they get to have their kind of their day in court and explain why their case should, in fact, be allowed to go forward. And eventually the trial court kind of hears both sides and decides who's right and who's wrong. And if the defendant's right, then the case gets dismissed. And if the plaintiff's right, the case gets to move forward. So that's kind of how civil lawsuits work, as most of our listeners probably know. Um, but there's an exception, and, and I guess an exception to that exception for plaintiffs who are too poor to pay that you know, few hundred dollar filing fee. And so if you can show that you're sufficiently impoverished, um, you can't afford the fee, uh, typically you can get to file your lawsuit under what's called IFP status, so informa pauperis status, um, some more law Latin, um, which means as a general matter that you can get into the court without paying that $400 or $450 fee. And so IFP status has been around for uh, over a century. And the basic idea is that we don't want people being unable to vindicate their rights in court simply because they can't afford to pay the filing fee. Uh, so there's the sense that we don't want poor people being shut out of the courthouse. So there's um, also a concern, which is, I guess, a little bit in tension with that, that while we don't want poor people getting shut out of the, the courthouse, you know, there's, there's this concern in certain sectors that we kind of do want to keep prisoners out of the courthouse, um, at least if their cases are, you know, frivolous or a burden on the justice system. Um, I think that the concern is that, you know, lots of prisoners don't have a lot of money, um, so they would ordinarily qualify for informa pauperous status. Um, lots of prisoners have a lot of time on their hands. Um, and, you know, if they don't have to pay the filing fee, the concern is that there is no real disincentive to them filing endless lawsuits that that will clog up the court system and, you know, at least potentially um, kind of distract from the prisoner litigation that actually is meritorious. So, you know, those are the concerns, whether they're right or wrong. Um, so Congress sought to address them in 1996 by passing the Prisoner Litigation Reform Act, which did a few things. Um, one, for prisoners specifically, it continues to allow IFP status, but it doesn't actually waive that filing fee. Um, instead of saying, you know, you can file your case without ever paying that multi-hundred dollar fee, it says, well, if you're a prisoner, you don't have to prepay it, um, but you're going to kind of have to pay it on an installment plan until the end of time. Um, another thing the PLRA did was that it required prisoners to exhaust all of the internal prison grievance procedures before they go to court and sue to vindicate their rights. And another thing it did is that it created a kind of three strikes mechanism, um, which is really at the heart of this 11th Circuit case that we're going to talk about soon, I promise. Um, so under the, the three strikes provision, um, if on three or more prior occasions while you, the plaintiff, have been in jail, if you've had a lawsuit dismissed on the grounds that it's frivolous, malicious, or that it fails to state a claim on which relief can be granted, if you've had three of those dismissals while you've been in prison, you're almost categorically ineligible for IFP status going forward. So if you want to file any more cases uh, in federal court, you have to pony up the, the $400 filing fee on the front end, and you don't get to be on this, this kind of payment plan. So that's kind of a lot of background. But basically what happened in this 11th Circuit case is there is a man who is in prison. He files a lawsuit um, under Section 1983 seeking to vindicate uh, various of his civil rights. And he has a history of having filed uh, lawsuits in the past. Uh, he's had three dismissals in the past. And so it raises this question of, okay, well, are those three prior dismissals strikes um, such that if he wants to file this fourth lawsuit, he has to somehow cobble together a few hundred bucks to pay the filing fee? Um, I'll just kind of note parenthetically that one of the one of the many downsides, not many downsides, a downside of the Prison Litigation Reform Act's three strikes provision is that it invites judges to make all kinds of like baseball puns. Um, and, and this case is no exception. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of built into the three strikes nomenclature this, anyway. But This um, you'll opinion see that got me thinking that if baseball rules were different or we had a different national pastime, you know, all kinds of areas of our law would be different than they are today. I mean, it's like three is the, it's the holy trinity, right? But it's because of baseball. Mm. 
I think, yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so anyway, so he has these these three um, prior cases, and the district court said, yeah, all each of those you know qualified as a strike under that statute that says you know you know if prior cases are dismissed as frivolous or malicious or failure to state a claim on which relief can be granted, then then you you've kind of struck out um, to to kind of buy into the the um, the baseball puns, but. The 11th Circuit on appeal, you know, the first time around, you know, really kind of struggled briefly with one of them because there was one of these three cases uh, previously that undisputedly qualified as a strike. Um, he had one of his cases dismissed for a failure to state a claim on which relief can be granted. It's a you know paradigmatic strike. Um, there was another one that was kind of a little bit closer. Um, and then there was a third one, though, where, where things got kind of tricky because his third case that got dismissed – um, was dismissed not uh, at the motion to dismiss stage, but at summary judgment. And it was dismissed for failure to exhaust, which is kind of a non-meritsy kind of ground. Um, so he argued that that um, prior case, in fact, didn't qualify as a strike within the language of the PLRA. And he also argued that one of the other two didn't either. And, you know, on the first go around, the three judge panel, in a very perfunctory opinion, said, well, we said pretty much the opposite a couple of years ago in a prior published panel decision, and we're bound by that, and there's not really much that we can do. Um, and at that point, the, uh, the, the plaintiff files a petition for, for end bank review, um, or, or on banc, as some call it, Anthony. Um, and that's when things kind of got just kind of generally unusual, um, and I'll, I'll flag a few of them. One, you know, because many of these prisoner cases are dismissed before defendants are even served. Um, in fact, at the at the panel stage, nobody had even shown up on behalf of the government to file an appellee's brief. So he filed his opening appellant's brief, and the panel just said nope. And he files his petition for rehearing, and there's still really nobody on the other side of the V. So they actually, you know, I was I was skimming the docket when you were when you were talking earlier, Anthony. It looks like um, they actually granted the petition for rehearing without the government ever having said a word in in the case, uh, at least on appeal. And so they just sent a letter to the Georgia AG saying, "Well, since we granted rehearing, maybe maybe if you want, you can kind of come in and you know argue this." Was other he side was of the he case. actually represented um, by with the en banc petition? Yeah, yeah. So it looks like the MacArthur Justice Center represented him at all stages, at least on the appeal. I, wow. I'm not sure and they you know, what the responded. dynamic was at the that's yeah at the district that's court. Crazy. Um, which 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 raises kind of another thing we can talk about for like a third or fourth rabbit hole about kind of this this phenomenon of just sua sponte dismissals in the PLRA context, which you know is, is something that that reasonable minds can think is a is a questionable idea. Um, but anyway, so. The Georgia Attorney General finally shows up, and eventually the um, the whole court and bank, you know, decides this kind of esoteric question about whether dismissals for failure to having um, failure to have exhausted your internal grievance processes, whether that's the kind of thing that counts as a strike um, for purposes of potentially kicking you out of this this IFP status, and you know. They, they ultimately said, you know, sometimes, but not in this case. Um, and we don't need to kind of go into the weeds on it a whole lot. But their, their idea was, you know, exhaustion is an affirmative defense. You know, typically we don't view affirmative defenses as being fodder for dismissals, you know, at the motion to dismiss stage where you're accepting all the complaints allegations is true. But there are certainly cases where kind of the inartful plaintiff can somehow manage to, to plead affirmative defenses in their complaint. Um, and if you're kind of inartful enough to do that, then sure, maybe your case can get dismissed and maybe it can be a strike. And honestly, it's all kind of complicated and it's not um, not really what makes this case all that interesting to me, at least. Um, so if, if you're if you're really interested in the esoterica of the PLRA, it's a pretty short opinion. But um, the, the court was unanimous in, in agreeing that, um, you know, that, that this guy didn't, in fact, have three strikes and that he could go back down and he doesn't have to pay this kind of for him, presumably prohibitive filing fee and can proceed in the lower courts and try to vindicate his rights. But that that's kind of the bottom line, but but it kind of sparked some kind of interesting thoughts or thoughts that were interesting to me um, about these kind of weird peculiarities of the Prison Litigation Reform Act, um, because it kind of built into the system is this what's called like a pre-screening requirement. Um, you know, Congress was so concerned about government officials, you know, being burdened with having to just show up and respond to what the legislators thought was this overwhelming flood of frivolous litigation that just baked into the system is the idea 
idea that when a prisoner files a, a complaint and, and seeks you know deferred payment of the filing fee because they can't afford to pay it, you know district courts have this obligation to kind of pre-screen the case before it's, I think before it's even served on the government um, to to figure out is this a case that is frivolous or malicious or whether it even fails to state a claim, um, and that's kind of commonplace. I mean, you'll see just hundreds of these you know really short district court decisions coming out you know on a monthly basis nationwide. Um, where you basically have the district court almost stepping into the shoes of the government, which has always struck me as as kind of an unusual state of affairs because um, you see these situations where the district court just like has only one party in front of them, just has the complaint, and they're just dismissing the complaint. Um, and they're doing it by basically creating arguments for why, you know, maybe some immunities apply or why there are certain defects in the complaint, basically kind of doing the government defendants work for them and not even requiring and, the government and to show up. And it's something the court noted yeah. was there's this form or it was one of the concurrences noted there, where you check a box and often it's on the yeah. basis of what, whether I think the box is whether they filed it um, before and it's confusing to the prisoner which box you should even check and yet that can be one of these strikes against you is what if you check the wrong box yeah that's exactly right and that just goes into the kind of what, what a quagmire this is because the supreme court has said that prisoners do not have to affirmatively plead in their complaint that they've exhausted all of their you know internal prison remedies um that's an affirmative defense that the government can come in and raise if they want to just as they might with any other affirmative defense but despite that you have a lot of district courts as the concurrence here pointed out that kind of do require um you know, prisoner plaintiffs to affirmatively plead exhaustion as part of their their opening you know case packet because they say you know if you want to file up if you're a prisoner and you want to file a complaint and seek um, inform a pauper status you have to fill out this form and check the box saying whether or not you exhausted your internal remedies and it turns out that's actually a pretty hard question because there's a you know decade or more of Supreme Court case law that makes everything you know complicated even for lawyers and you know how are we supposed to expect these typically pro se prisoners to figure that out and kind of distill that into whether you check a yes or a no on a box that might end up meaning that you get your case dismissed before the government even shows up to defend themselves. So, you know, it's all kind of a mess is kind of, kind of my take on it, Anthony. Um, And the whole concept of, you know, district courts being required to kind of step into the government's shoes and kind of like presumably go through a checklist of reasons for dismissing someone's complaint. Like to a degree, you sympathize with with the courts because there there are a lot of you know prisoner lawsuits, and you know there's obviously a temptation to try to process them in a streamlined fashion that lets the courts focus on you know cases that in, in many cases might have more merit. But just at a gut level, it feels kind of strange that you have the court kind of almost creating defenses for government government defendants who aren't even required to show up in the first place. Now, Bob, you worked on a federal appellate court in your clerkship. Um, are you, were you a, a big fan of PLRA, uh, you know, cases when they, they, they came up and you, you had to look through the materials? You know, I don't think one ever came to me. I think our, our work distribution must have been uh, different from most chambers. So uh, I, I was not that familiar with uh IFP or the PLR. Well, and often, right, this this kind of case and maybe some other types of routine appeals like, you know, maybe Social Security appeals, those kind of things are dealt with by a, a career clerk or a, the clerk's office is, is my understanding. So the, the judicial clerks maybe don't uh, get in the weeds of this stuff as much. Was that maybe true at the Fifth Circuit? Uh, I think it it could have been. We didn't have a career clerk, but there may have been. Uh, sort of a central intake thing for it. But it, it, it's also possible um, my, my judge, uh, Judge Smith, was um, had a tremendous capacity for work, uh, <laughs> an extremely bright guy. He might have been, you know, he might have been plowing through them when we weren't watching. So uh, that could be. Well, while uh, Sam was it was giving this uh, brilliant overview of the case, I actually did a b- little live research um, as they uh, as they say on the the rest is history uh, podcast, uh, shout out to those guys. Um, and I found Judge Newman's article, and it looks like from that and a couple other sources, uh, this there is in fact no like really bright line answer on what is a reversal and what is a vacator. But New- Judge Newman says that there are a few areas where it's fairly bright. So one is if if you ordered the complete opposite 
of what the district court ruled, that is reversed. If you reject interim relief, like a preliminary injunction, this is according to Judge Newman, that's vacated. And then if you'd reject a sentence in a, a criminal sentencing case, that's vacated because the sentence is vacated. And then it gets super duper gray after that. Um, and so that seems that seems you know, right. Well, one thing, thing. I, I went, I kind of looked at this a little bit one time because I was trying to figure out kind of what do we put in the conclusion of a brief. Um, I think we went with the reverse because it feels like more of a thing than vacater. So it kind of like maybe ask for ask for the most. But um, I ran across like a bunch of these like personal jurisdiction cases from the Supreme Court, right, where, you know, the lower courts say, you know, there's no personal jurisdiction and you're kicking the case. And when the court, the Supreme Court has reversed or whatever, when the Supreme Court has taken those cases, like it seems like sometimes they say that the lower court decision is vacated and sometimes they say it's reversed. And I, I couldn't make out really any any rhyme or reason, um, which isn't to say there isn't rhyme or reason, but it wasn't obvious to me. So uh, I had just one quick question about this. I don't know if either of you spent a lot of time with the the underlying panel opinion, but I, I was sort of confused about how this case sort of came to be in an in-bank procedure when w the third ground that we're talking about here under the IFP statute is dismissed for failure to state a claim. And the panel opinion was presented with a situation where this guy lost on summary judgment. So like I'm thinking dismissed for failure to state a claim is, I mean, that in common parlance, that means a 12B6 dis dismissal, not a not a summary judgment decision. So I was I was sort of surprised to find that the panel thought it was bound by this uh, case from 2020 that actually addresses a dismissal in the 12B6 uh, context. And so I. I don't know if either of you has any insight into why this wasn't just a straightforward uh, summary judgment is not a dismissal for failure to state a claim for relief. I I'll, I could be wrong about that, though. No, I think you're right. And I, I feel embarrassed that I don't have the answer. Um, <laughs> oh. I could just I could kind of read through the panel opinion more closely, but I I, I definitely um, don't I have just, the answer. Yeah. I did get the sense that these these strikes, these possible strikes are broader than just kind of a, a pointing to a technical rule. Um, and so there's, there's more to it than that, than, than just 12 B six. But, um, this, the specifics are, uh, are hard to grasp. Um, but you know what, that we're, we're giving you enough to grasp here on short circuit. And, uh, this, our, our listeners are much smarter than, uh, myself and our, our panelists. Sometimes, um, you can, uh, you can go, uh, go figure that out. We've given you, a, you know, enough to get started on. Um, so Bob is going to also give you enough to get started on for uh, some immigration questions and uh, a case coming out of the D.C. circuit. Um, and what happens when someone comes to this country and is a student, but then wants to stick around and get some work done, and whether that's part of your studies. So, uh, Bob, what happened in this case? So thanks, Anthony. Uh, uh, unlike Sam's case, uh, I have the very easy, uh, INA, uh, statute to kind of wade through and, uh, it, it, it was a good time. Uh, <laughs> this case is sort of, a, as Anthony teed up, it's at bottom about the relationship between the conditions of entry uh, to the United States, which are determined by Congress in the INA, and the uh, and just, I guess just the for our, our non-immigrants and uh, non-lawyers, the Immigration and Naturalization Act is it that's right. right. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe originally of you know 1924 uh, and renewed a bunch of times and edited since then, but um, it, it, it's about the relationship between those conditions of entry and the for lack of a better term, the conditions of remaining in the country. And the first stuff is set by Congress in the INA. The conditions of remaining are sort of broadly speaking delegated to the DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and its secretary. So um, this case is called uh, Washington Alliance of uh, Technological Workers versus DHS. And we're talking about a denial of in-bank rehearing. So 
At bottom, uh, or, or sort of underlying this case, is the F-1 student visa program that allows you to come and uh, be here for a, uh, a temporary time and solely for the purpose of uh, following a course of study. And in March 2016, DHS promulgated a regulation specifically for students in the STEM area, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that said, um, even when you are done with your course of study at a university uh, here in the United States, you can stay for up to three years uh, and work in a related field. And the theory was um, staying and working for another three years is a sort of practical occupational training that you might, you know, tuck into the uh, otherwise uh, otherwise clear language course of study uh, and student. Um, so a union of technological workers who were upset that um, these highly skilled uh, foreign students in the STEM areas were allowed to stay in the United States and compete with them. This union brought um, a lawsuit claiming that the regulation was beyond DHS's delegated authority. Uh, and they lost at trial, uh, or I'm sorry, they lost at the trial court uh, and before uh, the D.C. Circuit panel appealing uh a summary judgment ruling for the government. Uh, it, there's a complicated procedural history related to standing. It goes up and down a couple times, but broadly speaking, the, the panel upholds the district court because um, the secretary has authority to set the, uh, the, the time and conditions of uh, these non-immigrant visa holders, their stay in the United States. And uh, that includes, um, for, for purposes of the F-1 visa statute and the program, um, the, the secretary has authority to allow these students to stay for reasonably related employment. Um, Judge Henderson uh, was on the panel and uh, dissented because, in her view, um, the words student and course of study are, are pretty clear uh, in the INA. Once you graduate from a, a college, in, in her view, and I think I share this view, once you, once you graduate from college or whatever graduate course you're studying in, you sort of, you cease to be a student. And uh, once you start working uh, for a year or two years or three years, you're not in a course of study anymore. You're now an employee or a worker. Um, and so uh, because Congress in the INA has said this group of non-immigrant visa holders is allowed to come into the country only or you know, solely for the purpose of studying and, and solely as students, they have to meet both of those qualifications for the entire time that they're in the United States. And so to the extent um, the secretary can set other conditions of their stay, they have to be sort of um, within those broader category or the broader conditions of entry. You have to be a student and you have to be here solely for a course of study. Uh, after the panel issued its opinion, the D.C. Circuit considered but denied uh, a, a request that the case be reheard in bank. And um, Judge Henderson dissented from the denial of in-bank rehearing and essentially incorporated her entire dissent by reference. And then um, Judge Rao also issued a statement um, dissenting from the denial of rehearing in bank. Was that statement, Bob, a dissental? Technically, you know, I actually don't. I don't know that I understand the difference between a dissent and a dissental. Well, what I, do you? And I don't think it usually says dissental in 
like statements on uh, denials of on banc with dissents, but I have heard that word. In fact, I think it was a short circuit a couple years ago. It was for, I first heard it and I was like, that's made up. And then I realized lots of people use this word dissental. Um, I mean, most words are made which up, must have some I, I genealogy to it. I don't know, but uh, I, I, I think it is a real word that real lawyers actually use. That might be another one for us to crowdsource with the uh, with the listeners. Maybe I mean, you got to come up with like a, a, a loyalty program where the more of these problems your listeners solve, they they get some perks. Well, or we'll something. have Maybe a prize a to the first listener to write in and say, you know, where dissental comes from. Why is can, that? Can I, thing? I had like a vague recollection that might be wrong, um, consistent with most of, of what I've been saying uh, on this episode, which I, I think that former Judge Kaczynski may have coined it, ah. but I, I just have this kind of foggy recollection of that maybe being a thing from maybe 10 years or so ago, but doubtless our, our listeners are better informed. So, so Bob, whatever you call this thing, uh, Judge Rao, uh, she did not agree and, uh, and agreed with Judge Henderson, you were saying. That's right. Yeah. Judge Rao raises a number of issues with the, uh, the majority's opinion on the panel and the refusal to rehear in bank. I mean, she agrees with Judge Henderson, it seems, that the INA is, is pretty clear that people who come in under the F-1 program, they have to be students and they have to be here solely for a course of study. And that um, the, the DHS's regulations sort of um, jettison those conditions of entry and say, you know, uh, opens the door uh, opens the door for the DHS to kind of look at each one of these different categories of non-immigrant visas and essentially expand them beyond recognition. Uh, if you were to look just at the text of the statute uh, that that Congress had enacted, and a kind of an interesting part of the dissent is uh, her reference to the. Um, the Supreme Court's recent opinion in West Virginia versus EPA uh, saying, you know, you can't you can't infer from Congress's like extremely, extremely detailed uh, provisions in the INA that um, by saying students here solely for a temporary time and solely for a course of study uh, was a a sort of implicit delegation to the DHS secretary to allow those people to stay when they were no longer students and no longer actually engaged in a course of study. So um, that that sort of dropping in West Virginia versus EPA might be a call uh, to to the uh, the big court to hear this case uh, um, with a properly placed uh, cert petition. Uh, she also points out that. Um, D.C. Circuit precedent already requires the result that that Judge Henderson and she support and that instead the uh, the panel opinion had relied on a Third Circuit opinion um, that that's obviously not binding. Uh, She points out as well uh, that, you know, I don't think any judge likes to wind up on the the short end of a lopsided circuit split. But uh, she points out that the D.C. Circuit is now. in that very position and that they did not need to be. Uh, and, and finally, I think the the kind of the really interesting thing to me uh, about this opinion is uh, near the end, after the kind of the three stars, when when Judge Rao is closing up, she points out that, like, you know, this very well might be good policy to to allow more STEM graduates to stay in the United States longer and to work and to pay taxes here. Uh, but, you know, good policy is not uh, not exactly the the end goal for a, a, an Article three judge. I mean, the, the obligation here is to look at the text of the statute and say, uh, has the statute delegated this kind of authority to the secretary, to this agency? Uh, and, and as she points out, the uh, the reasonably related uh, limitation, like saying uh, DHS can extend the time or the conditions so long as they are reasonably related to the original conditions of entry, is kind of you know kind of unlimited. It's it, it's hard to see a meaningful limit on that. 
uh, when you look at all the different categories of non-immigrant visas, like one of the one of the examples she points out are agricultural workers who, you know, fall into a number of buckets. And the last one is uh, a, a non-immigrant who is working pressing apples into cider uh, on a on like an apple orchard or at like a farm or something. And so, you know, you can you can imagine like if that person that non-immigrant comes in under an H-1B visa and is pressing apples into cider, can can DHS say, uh, well, we're actually going to start a program for all non-immigrant visa holders who are pressing apples into cider. They can stay uh, in perpetuity if they open uh, a cidery, you know, because that's reasonably related. And we have plenty of craft breweries and distilleries, but, you know, cideries are not really... They're not really thriving in the United States like we'd like to see. So we're going to let these folks stay and open their cideries. Like, is that reasonably related? Apples are being pressed into cider in both areas. Um, that is not something that's in the opinion. It's just something I thought about when I read it. But um, that's how she closes up. And I, 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 I think it's an interesting tension between, you know, tension in this case, like we think it would be good to have these folks here. We need more people in STEM jobs, uh, but this isn't necessarily the way to get that done. So uh, that was the dissent or the dissental, whichever you prefer. Sam, do you uh, do, do, do you tend to take much, much stock of uh, dissentals? Like the, the term or the kind of the well, substance of them? Um, I, I, like Bob, I don't love the term. I mean, it feels like it's a portmanteau, except it's not actually conjoining two separate words. I don't, I don't quite understand where it comes from, but I guess, I guess your listeners will tell us at some point, or maybe they won't. We can figure it out ourselves. Um, as for substance, I know I don't really have a strong, strong feelings on it. If, if I recall, wasn't there like a bit of a spat in the ninth circuit a couple of years back, a lot of going back and forth about, you know, some judges were getting kind of fired up because they thought some of their colleagues were basically like using this, um, dissental mechanism to basically kind of like write litigants cert petitions for them. Um, so it seems like it's certainly been a bit of a hot topic in at least some circuits recently. Um, I had one other thought related to this, which I'd, I'd welcome your guys' insights on as well. Um, I honestly thought it was a little bit unusual that Judge Henderson kind of had that one paragraph. I'll use dissental just as a shorthand, but that she had that one paragraph dissental that basically incorporated by reference her actual panel dissent. Um, I, I've never, I don't know that I've ever seen that before. And it struck me as unusual for a couple of reasons. One, I had thought that at least in some circuits there was there was some kind of tradition that if you were like the panel dissenter, you wouldn't register your dissent from a, an end bank denial. The idea being that, well, that kind of goes without saying because I wrote that dissent to the panel. Um, I'm not sure if, if that's a commonplace thing or maybe I just imagined it. Um, but the other thing that struck me as kind of unusual is kind of what was the point of of doing that, right? I mean, it's not like she had to preserve her arguments. She, she, you know, she's the she's a judge, right? She's not a litigant, um, and all of her views were all already stated in the um, in the panel dissent. So I, I don't know. I assume that there was a reason for her doing that. I, I just have never seen it before, and it struck me as kind of unusual. And the, the, the reason for it wasn't obvious. To I me, think so. I don't know if I've seen it exactly this way. Where really, that's as you said, that's all she said. But I think judges in often in en banc denials of petitions on banc will say, you know, I still dissent uh, if they dissented in the original panel opinion um, or just register like, you know, Judge Smith dissents from the yeah. from the denial. Yeah, maybe you're right. Um, if they don't want to have a further statement. But I, th I think a statement of some kind is is common. Sometimes, you know, they might add a little bit even to their uh, original dissent. Um, but it does, I think it does depend on the circuit, which, it, which brings up another point, um, to note for, for those listeners who remain with us and are fascinated by on bonk procedure. Um, it really does vary amongst the circuits, right? How often they go on bonk. I think, um, the DC circuit historically, it's been quite unusual, I think it's a little more usual lately as it's a more divided court, but it's been unusual. Um, the Ninth Circuit does it all the time and has this crazy math where you have 29 full judges on the court and only 11 hear petitions on bonk. So it's always like a lottery 
as to whether you're going to get get on bonk and then get a reversal if you do go on bonk. Um, so you can see there's an incentive in the Ninth Circuit that maybe isn't there in, in other circuits. Um, the Fifth Circuit, I think, goes a, a fair amount, right? If you, I mean, just anecdotally, it seems like they they definitely go on bonk a, a fair amount. The Eleventh Circuit, like we like Sam's case, but um, the Second Circuit, I guess, hardly ever go. I mean, it's very rare. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying never, but like compared to other circuits, it's quite rare. And they just had a a denial of on bonk the other day that split six to six, and so that means it doesn't go on bonk because uh, there was no majority that wanted to with a statement. It was a religious liberty case, um, but it was um, it was quite unusual, I guess, that there was this the split and this this statement. And so a lot of this just you know it's, it's important for litigators to keep in mind. A lot of this just comes down to the the culture of that particular set of judges and their staff, and that really can vary. Um, in different circuits. Yeah. Um, isn't it, isn't it the case? I, I had understood that in, in the second circuit and maybe a few other circuits, there was this kind of like informal behind the scenes kind of polling of judges. Like if, if you're on a panel and you want to overrule a prior panel decision, instead of kind of going through the whole end bank process, you kind of just like send it to all the other judges, you know, just email to them and say, Hey, are you guys okay with us, uh, overrule in this case. And, um, uh, and I, I think like the Seventh Circuit actually has like that that is codified by rule in their local rules. But my understanding is a few other courts kind of do that in a more informal way. So maybe that explains some of the the difference between you know the number of cases that are actually formally going in bank. I, I think that's probably right, and that that inf- informal process definitely is true. And like in state courts too, like for example, the Minnesota Court of Appeals, which does not have an en banc process, but it does have. A fair amount of judges, and they only sit in three judge panels. I think it's about fifteen judges. Um, they, um, if they publish opinions, and then they have unpublished opinions, and that very few published opinions and only published opinions are considered to be precedential. And if they have a published opinion, they will actually pass it around to other judges and say, you know, not like, do we have a full majority for the? I don't think it's that like formal, but it's. It's, hey, are you super uncomfortable with this kind of thing? And so they, they get a little bit of a, at least have a consensus, whereas unpublished, they just, they just keep it, those three judges. Um, and so there's a little bit of that, I think, in, in a lot of groups of appellate judges that, that work that way, even if it's not codified. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for going on bonk or in bank or whatever your cup of tea is with us today. Um, hopefully you've learned a few things. Uh, you have quite a lot of links in the show notes, uh, more than usual, that if you want to go down some of your own rabbit holes, but we're always here to take you down rabbit holes of our own. And I really appreciate um, getting this band back together and, uh, and burying the hatchet on the on bonk controversy. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope uh, all the listeners uh, get can share some love and share some love for uh, the Circuit Courts of Appeals and the Short Circuit podcast and newsletter. And until next time, though, I hope you all get engaged.